The Gerda, in the district of luckau danneberg in Lower Saxony, is a popular destination for young and old. On the 21st of May 1989, a couple from Hamburg, Peter and Ursula Reinold, went to the Gerda to go for a walk. It is believed that the 45-year-old woman and her 51-year-old husband went to a clearing in Jagen 147 to sunbathe or to have a picnic. At some stage, a murderer took them by surprise. The couple were killed there, but not left at the scene of the crime. The perpetrator took his victims to a nearby excavated area and hid them there. The victims were found nude. Whether they undressed themselves before the murder or were undressed by the perpetrator remains unclear. The perpetrator also stole their Steiner binoculars and a picnic basket and took the couple's car keys. The murderer then fled Gerda in a Honda Civic and left the car 300 meters from the train station in Vinzen Lua, a small town in Hamburg's commuter belt. The couple were reported missing when they didn't arrive home that day. Seven weeks later, on the 12th of July 1989, three blueberry pickers discovered the bodies. They were extensively decomposed, partially mummified and largely skeletonized from the high temperatures and animal feeding. Due to the condition of the two bodies, the exact cause of death could not be determined, either at the scene of the crime or by the subsequent autopsy. What was certain, however, was that suicide or an accident were out of the question, and that death had occurred as a result of a crime. Investigators believe the couple had been shot, beaten and strangled. The husband had an injury to his larynx. However, it could not be determined whether these were signs of strangulation or injuries caused by the foraging and trampling of wild boars. After the three blueberry pickers discovered the two bodies, they went to the forest ranger to call the police. On the way there, they met a brown-haired, heavily built man in his forties carrying a bag in his hand. The police speculate that this was the killer who was looking for other victims on that day. On the 12th of July 1989, a 46-year-old housewife from Ulzen and a 43-year-old salesman from Hanover went for a drive to the Gerde. They had decided to go there after lunch from nearby Bad Bevinson. Both were married, but not to each other. They had met during a stay at a wellness resort, and their spouses knew nothing about their relationship. They parked on a small side road near the Röten Forester's Lodge and walked more than two kilometers into the forest. There, in the forest section Jagen 138, they came face to face with their killer. He probably threatened them with a gun and tied their hands and feet with medical tape. Both were made to lie face down. The perpetrator then strangled the male victim and executed him from behind with a small caliber weapon. The perpetrator then smashed the skull of the female victim. He stole a Polaroid instant camera and the car keys of a Toyota Tercel from the male victim, with which he left the scene. Further investigations revealed that the killer drove around in this vehicle for about a week before parking it near the spa clinic in Bad Bevinson.
Two weeks later, on the 27th of July 1989, police officers discovered the two victims of the second double murder as part of a comprehensive search for evidence of the first double murder. The crime scene was only about 800 metres from where the victims of the first murders were found. According to the reconstructions of the investigators, the perpetrator committed the second double murder on the same day. Subsequent tests showed that the gunshots would not have been heard despite the short distance, because both the location of the bodies of the first murder victims and the crime scene of the second murder victims were in ground depressions. The parallels between the two crimes lay in the similar ages of the couples murdered, and in the same wooded area of a huge forest. In addition, the perpetrator stole similar items from the victims in both cases. Investigators didn't deem it a classic robbery murder. The unknown killer took the car keys from both pairs of victims, and in both cases he left the vehicles in nearby small towns with rail connections. Both cities are located on the Hanover-Hamburg railway line. These parallels led investigators to believe it was the same person in both cases. The two double murders also had a significant impact for the residents of the Gerde. The entire region was terrified. The area where the murder victims were found was dubbed Forest of the Dead by the press. Hikers and day-trippers avoided the forest with the famous giant trees for years afterwards. Because of the notoriety of the case, the Lower Saxony police formed a 40-strong special commission with detectives from the region and from Lüneburg. The commission interviewed approximately 10,000 people. An identikit was created and published, plus a reward of 50,000 Deutschmarks. In December 1989 and again in January 1990, the case was broadcast on the television by an unsolved crime show called Aktenzeichen XY, but no significant leads came about. Police psychologists characterized the perpetrator as aggressive, introverted, mentally ill with sexual deviations and with a strong sense of superiority. They believe he was employed and was able to fit the murders into his work schedule. Meine Damen und Herren, im vergangenen Sommer wurde in einem großen Wald- und Ausflugsgebiet im Raum Lüneburg relativ kurz hintereinander zwei Doppelmorde verübt. Spätestens nach Bekanntwerden des zweiten Doppelmordes haben die Wanderer und Spaziergänger die Gürde gemieden, verständlicherweise. Und bei vielen Leuten wirkt eine gewisse Angst bis heute nach. Hauptkommissar Michaelis von der Kripo Lüneburg erfährt das immer wieder. Shortly thereafter, on August the 14th, 1989, a certain Birgit Meyer disappeared from her house near Lüneburg. The night before she had met with her estranged husband, Harold Meyer. Her last phone call was with her daughter that same evening at around 10.30 p.m., When she could no longer be reached by phone at 7 a.m. the next morning, the police were called. Due to the infamy of the previous cases, the Meyer case was only half-heartedly investigated. A search of the house revealed an open terrace door. Birgit's nightgown was missing and a used handkerchief was found by the bed. No valuables were taken, however. The police theorized it might be a case of suicide. Birgit Meyer was known to be a heavy drinker and was depressed at the time. Harold Meyer, the estranged husband, owned a printing shop. He runs up missing posters and offers a reward. The police suspect him of having something to do with his wife's disappearance. 
However, he himself suspects the neighbor's gardener, Kurt Werner Wickmann, who is a would-be playboy and had a case history of attempting to seduce wealthy women. A colleague of Birgit's came forward and revealed that on the day of her disappearance, she had mentioned a man she had allegedly become close to, having met him at a neighbor's birthday party a few weeks earlier. When this man, Herr Wichmann, was questioned, he denied any close connection with Birgit, but his behavior suggested that he was hiding something. In addition, the cemetery gardener had a long criminal record, from burglary to sexual harassment, rape and attempted manslaughter. In the Birgit Meyer case, however, there is no concrete evidence against him. In the meantime, an identikit which was created in the case of the Goethe murders puts Wickmann in the spotlight, but he is ruled out as the perpetrator because he wears glasses on the photo on his ID card, and only because of this is a similarity with the identikit ruled out. A year later, investigator Klaus Werner takes on the Birgit Meyer case. He firmly suspects that a crime has been committed and discovers that a dirt road at the back of Meyer's house leads directly to the neighboring town very near to Wickmann's house. However, in October 1990, a search warrant request for the house was denied. The investigations against Harold Meyer continued for the time being. In September 1992, three years after Birgit Meyer's disappearance, investigators received new information about Wichmann, and a search of his house was finally approved. A locked room is discovered on the first floor, to which only Wichmann and his brother have access. There, the investigators discovered Nazi reading material, S&M videos, firearms, narcotics, restraining tools, and much more. However, this is not sufficient for an arrest warrant. When they searched the house again, they found a secret passage behind another door through which Wickman's garage below can be reached with a rope. They also discovered a bugging system which led to a secret bedroom in the basement and, the most strangest find, a new sports car buried under a slope in the garden. At that point in time, Wickmann had six cars registered in his name, and one of them, the sports car, was found buried on his property, surrounded by a rock garden. Most shocking, however, was that the vehicle had bloodstains on the back seat, and use of cadaver dogs suggested its trunk had contained a body at one point. Belongings in one of his other cars also indicated that he often drove long distances and slept in the vehicle. Shortly after February the 24th, 1993, Wickmann cleared his workplace and went on the run. During his escape, he threatened Harold Meyer by phone. On March the 30th, 1993, he causes an accident in his car, but remained at large. 
after a second accident on April the 15th, 1993, near Heilbronn, the police found a submachine gun in the fugitive's car. He was arrested and taken into custody for possession of a gun. There he hanged himself with his belt on April the 25th, 1993, and left a strange farewell letter. As a result, the investigations against Wickman are stopped, and all evidence, including the car and weapons, are destroyed. Under German law, criminal investigation into a suspect must cease if the suspect is no longer alive. When Birgit Meyer's brother, Wolfgang Silov, retired in 2002, he himself was an investigator at the time. He could now devote all of his time to investigate his sister's disappearance and gained access to the files on the case. With the help of Reinhard Chedor, he creates a private team in which Professor Klaus Puschel, Gerhard Strate and Martin Kernke are also involved. They examine Wickmann's house again whose wife has since passed away. The second husband of Wickman's deceased wife allows them access. Many of Wickman's private things in the hidden room are amazingly still there. They make another interesting discovery. Newspaper clippings about the murder of Ilse Gerkens, who was shot in a forest in 1968. The murder was never solved but Wickman's name also appears in this police file as a potential suspect. He was 19 years old at the time of the crime. Could he possibly have had something to do with this murder? An evidence item was discovered in the Forensic Medicine Department in Hanover, which had escaped destruction in 1993. Handcuffs from Wickman's room. Sent to a crime lab, Birgit Meyer's blood was found on them. Thus, Wickman is finally connected as the perpetrator, but her body was still missing. After further intensive but fruitless investigations, in which they nearly gave up, they discovered a mechanic's car pit under an old car that had been sitting there for years. The pit appeared to be too shallow for its original purpose. They realized that this was probably what they had been looking for. On September the 29th, 2017, the skeletonized remains of Birgit Meyer were found. She had been shot. Because of the condition of the remains, it is not known whether Wichmann killed Birgit immediately or tortured her for days or even weeks after her kidnapping. Kurt Werner Wichmann was considered a womanizer. Blonde hair, sunglasses, always a well-groomed appearance. But the man who lived on the edge of the forest in Gerda near Luneburg was also an oddball, even wearing gloves in midsummer. Investigators have recovered a total of 423 items at the serial killer's former property since April 2018 including a number of women's shoes, dresses, handbags, knives and jewellery. According to the Luneburg police, 217 items of evidence seized 
were relevant to the investigation. They are still trying to piece together the puzzle surrounding Wichmann's crimes. A year after the start of the excavations, the police drew up a profile of the suspected serial killer. Where he lived, what kind of car he drove, how he proceeded with his murders. The officials sent this document to German and foreign authorities, in the hope that this would lead to other unsolved cases. With success, 236 cold case files from several police departments, in which Wichmann was examined as a suspect, including murders, rapes and missing persons. Kurt Werner Wichmann was born on July 8, 1949. He grew up in makeshift housing set up for low-income families. His mother showed no maternal instinct, and his father was physically abusive. He was withdrawn and isolated from his peers, which was no doubt partly to his home environment. His favorite place of refuge and peace of mind was in a forest close to his house. He started displaying violent tendencies at the tender age of 10. He would spend much of his time in the forest torturing, killing and afterwards burying animals, mostly birds and frogs. To add to his already traumatized childhood, his parents decided that they couldn't afford to keep him and gave him up to foster care. This only drove him further into isolation and led him to spending more time developing the violent side of his personality. Wichmann committed his first serious offence at 14, when he broke into his adoptive parents' neighbour's residence using a glass cutter, and climbed into the bed to choke the woman who was asleep at the time. The woman survived, and because Wichmann claimed that he had only intended to rob the home, his sentence was only one year in juvenile detention. When police went to arrest Wichmann, he threatened them with a small caliber rifle. The officers shot the 18-year-old in the leg. He was still able to flee, but is then caught. However, he ran away before the sentence could be carried out. In 1968, 38-year-old Ilse Gerkens was cycling through a forest near Lüneburg when she was hit in the back by four bullets from a small caliber rifle. The woman dies. Wichmann comes under suspicion. His apartment is searched, but the local police don't investigate further. This is the beginning of a whole series of investigative mishaps by the Lüneburg Criminal Police Office. In 1970, when he was 21 years old, Wichmann committed his second crime. He raped and attempted to murder a 17-year-old hitchhiker. He was convicted and prosecutors asked for a 12-year sentence. However, he was sentenced to serve only five and a half years in prison and even managed to get an early parole release. Over the next two decades, Kurt was to all intents and purposes a law-abiding citizen and built a new life with forged documents false resumes, and the facade of a happily married man. Wichmann liked to search for sex partners with private ads in magazines. He couldn't resist using words like woods and forest in his personal ads. Even though outward appearances showed he led a relatively comfortable life, later investigations revealed that he was almost always short of cash. He was also known to possess several guns inside the cars he owned and in the secret room at his home. In 
In 1974, Wichmann is released early from Wolfenbüttel Prison for good behavior. The criminal moves to the Karlsruhe area and lives there for three years with an older woman. During this time, several young women, some of whom were hitchhiking, were murdered nearby. The cases were never solved. In 1980, Wichmann inherits his parents' house and 15,000 square meters of land. The killer has since married. He works alternatively as a car dealer and gardener. Fast forward to 1993. Police found a suicide note left by Wichmann after he had killed himself by hanging. His note requested that his wife keep his property within the family, adding, Please don't just think about my bad side. God have mercy on me. In 2017, the subsequent unearthing of Birgit Meyer's body from under the floor of his garage revealed the real reason behind his last request. In the secret room that he kept locked in his house, investigators found, apart from videotapes that included Nazi themes and pornography, newspaper coverage of Birgit's case and the Gerda murders. Birgit Meyer's brother, Wolfgang Silov, and his investigative team makes a spectacular discovery. Wichmann's skin flakes are found in the car of one of the Gerda murders victims, archived on adhesive film at the time. In 2018, with the consent of the new owner, Wichmann's former house and property was again extensively examined, because it is certain that there was at least one accomplice. Police suspect Wichmann's brother, who was 10 years his junior. At the house, other buried things are found, such as car parts, purses, handbags and women's shoes. Unfortunately, there is not enough evidence to point to who his accomplice was. The public prosecutor's office names an unknown person as an accomplice in the Gerda murders. One who is still among us, said investigator Schubert. In September 2017, the man was invited for an interview, but his lawyer declined, saying his client had nothing to say. Wichmann's final escape from justice and the destruction of numerous pieces of evidence could have been prevented. The Lüneburg police are calling on all German police departments to report unsolved murders from the time Wichmann was active. More than 250 reports have been received so far. However, since the cases date back at least 27 years, it is extremely difficult for investigators to make any progress. Here is a list of murders where Wichmann is a strong suspect. July 6, 1967, Hinarina F., 37, killed in a forest near Maschen. September 1, 1967, Hildegard T., 60, killed in a Lüneburg Park. April 11, 1968, Ilse G., 38, was fatally hit in the back by four shots from a small caliber rifle as she was cycling through a wooded area near Lüneburg. Witnesses see a youth who is said to resemble Wichmann flee the scene. The police later found eight A4 pages with newspaper clippings on the murder of Ilse G. in Wichmann's room. May 14, 1969. Ulrike Burmeister, 14, was murdered in Lüneburg. August 23, 1984. 
Irma B, 59, rides her bike into the forest near Wustro. She is later found strangled and stabbed and disemboweled with a kitchen knife. August 23, 1986, Elspeth M, 60, rides her bike in a field near Lunenburg. She is found raped, strangled, and mutilated in the abdomen. April 10th, 1989, Gitta S, 45, is walking her dog in a forest near Holm Seppensen. She is found stabbed. May the 4th, 1989, Brigitte T is stabbed to death in the heath near Muden on the Erze. Well, my dear friends, what did you think of Kurt Werner Wichmann? Die Blonde Bistie, as the Germans called him. Quite terrifying, because he didn't look like an evil killer, did he? I'm sure a lot of people, well, obviously there were a lot of people taken in by him and, uh, you know, had a false sense of security around him. I mean, did his wife know anything? Did she suspect anything? He was obviously, I did read he was a narcissistic psychopath. Perhaps he hid it well and put up a, you know, a facade and a different persona around his wife and friends. But it must have been terrifying for the ones who, who saw the evil side of him. I mean, that poor Birgit Meyer. Oh, my goodness, I hope her death was quick. I hope he wasn't torturing her for weeks or months. Horrifying. I wonder how his wife felt afterwards, knowing that for years, you know, she had lived over a dead body in the garage. And that for some time that woman had been alive, locked up in a secret room in the house. What a horrifying thought for her. Wow. All those things they found in the garden, it's horrifying. They belong to people. Where those people are, they don't know. And I'm going to show you a German site where they have featured displays of some of these articles in the hope that somebody can identify them. Because they don't know how many people that he, that he did kill. Uh, there's lots of people who are also missing that he might be directly him and his accomplice may be directly responsible for as well. So they're, they're relying on information from members of the public and hoping that they can reconnect the dots, which, as detailed in the video, is hard to do after so many decades. Some of these cases may never be solved. He was obviously very, very cunning, you know, to, to, to bury stuff like that. Now, if he's buried stuff like that in his own garden, how much stuff has he buried elsewhere? That, that's just crazy, isn't it? He has a, in this photo here, he has a look, or these two photos, a look of Jeffrey Dahmer. What do you think? Also that sort of pretty packaging uh, with that cold insectile interior. I hope this is a case that you haven't heard of, by the way. I'm quite sure there's many of you who don't know about this case. Also about the car buried, in case you're wondering, uh, there wasn't much information in the video about it. The Ford Probe, he had leased it. It was only a matter of months, a few months or several months old. He had leased it and I would say most certainly committed a murder in it or transported a murder victim in the car and decided to not only get rid of the lease payments because he could report it stolen afterwards, but also get rid of the evidence by burying the car. I mean, how insane is that? What is it with this guy and burying things? Yes, there seemed to be at least one dismantled car under the garden, possibly a few. There was also car keys, uh, all sorts of stuff. Madness. But to bury a whole car, I never heard of anything like that before. And that was another part of his psychopathy, that he liked to present this image of being wealthy and having lots of cars, uh, whereas in fact... He didn't really have much money at all. He inherited the house from his parents, otherwise he wouldn't have even had that. Uh, I don't know whether the wife had any money, but he had this facade of being well-to-do. The appearance is attractive. Yeah, he conned, conned a lot of people. And the poor um, husband of Birgit Meyer, his name escapes me at the moment, but I did hear on a documentary that he has suffered psychologically for years because of the suspicion that fell on him. And he says, to this day, even though that they know that Kurt Wickman committed the murder, 
uh, and that even after when the body was found at his house, he said there were still people in his town that were looking at him with suspicion and, uh, you know, it obviously affected him psychologically. What a terrible thing. And because the police had accused him, they pointed the finger at him originally and, and that stuck. Terrible. I feel so sorry for him. And how is this for the hypocrisy of the narcissistic psychopath and, and narcissists in general? You know, they can never accept the blame for anything. If they've done something wrong, which they always do, they blame others. They project that blame onto others because they could not possibly do anything wrong. They're perfect. I can't remember if I detailed this in the previous presentation there, but uh, just as he was going on the run, as Kurt Wickman was hitting the road to go on the run, because he knew that the police were going to be digging up his garden and searching the house, he phoned Harold Meyer, I remember his name now, he phoned the ex-husband of Birgit Meyer and said he was coming to get him, to kill him. That's why he had the machine gun with him. He was coming to get him. So he has projected the blame that his life has been turned upside down, destroyed, because Harold Meyer was pointing the finger at him, and rightly so. He's took away this guy's ex-wife. I know they were no longer together, but they have a lot of loving memories. He's took this guy's wife, killed her, tortured her, whatever, raped her. And now he's saying that you're to blame, I'm coming to kill you. I, I, you can't get over these nut cases, can you? He couldn't look inside himself and realise that he was to blame for everything that, uh, you know, that was coming to fruition at this point, the collapse of his life. He had done all that. He'd got away, he'd got away with murder for so long. Horrible, horrible crimes. And what's this about the accomplice? I can't say too much because the brother's still alive, but the police suspect him. What's going on there? He was the only one that had access to Kurt Vickerman's secret room. And I did hear one of the police reports that said he's of an age now where he's no longer a danger to the public. I'm thinking, hey, that's just not good enough. If that guy was an accomplice to murder, oh, that's so annoying that they couldn't find any DNA just exactly who the accomplice was. Anyway, wherever that brother's living, if they know his name and his association to his brother, I'm sure, you know, it can't be a very comfortable life. And they, they're pretty sure that he did have an accomplice. So, mm, Let me know your thoughts on this case. Let me know your thoughts on this case. I, wanna, I, want, I just want to show you this quaint postcard. When I saw this, I brought a smile to my face. Fernseher Raum means TV room. Can you remember hotels when they had TV rooms? That is so sweet. I remember when I was a kid and we went to stay in places like Blackpool and we'd go down there and they have those guest houses. I remember those TV rooms. You know, the guests could sit in there and watch TV. It's so cute. And in this 80s postcard, obviously they presented it as a modern thing, you know, this amenity. The, the TV room. I thought that's so cute. As promised, this is the German police site featuring the items they found under Wickman's garden. All under his garden, possibly some from the house. You know, there's men's shirts, trousers, women's blouses, um, a whole array of item, women's handbags. These people, they, I would say they're dead. Uh, there's the other car. There's some sort of blue. It's Honda Civic. There's a blue Honda Civic. It's not the Honda Civic from the Forest Murders. They've got that car. There's another Honda Civic. Terrible. Really terrible. What's going on there? And there's obviously Mercedes-Benz parts here. Buried. That's a battery. Was it from his own Mercedes-Benz? Or did he steal someone's Mercedes-Benz? Or did he just like burying things? It's just got me baffled. I've never really heard of anything like this before. Uh, license plates from cars. Somebody's ring. That person is obviously no longer alive. A little heart-shaped brooch or something or pendant. Um, shovels. What on earth is that? I don't really know. Shoes, boots, slippers, more female boots. Oh, they're sort of shoe stretchers, aren't they? Obviously a part of a revolver, swords, knives. Obviously he's committed murders with these, with these weapons. Axes. And uh, it appears to be money. Oh no, it's uh, cufflinks, isn't it? Cufflinks. Um, wow. 
don't know what that is or what it was syringes that was probably his tranquilizing syringe keys house keys sunglasses my goodness look at all that oh, that's a is that a car key there for a golf or something are there more syringes there Practically everything has been buried. Telecarte, telephone cards, hotel, someone's wallet, purses, more wallets. My goodness. What is that, some sort of whiskey or something? Who the hell buries whiskey? Or whatever it is, or spirits. And there's obviously more stuff than that. This is just the stuff that they have listed that probably they haven't been able to identify yet. Wow, wow, wow. On that note, my dear friends, I'm going to say goodbye. This video has went on for some time now. I hope you've enjoyed it. Give me your feedback. And uh, yes, take care. God bless and bye-bye. Before I turn off the old ancient microphone in the abandoned radio studio, some of you may not be aware of the competition, the giveaway that's running at the moment here on Patreon, and it's for this creation. This is my own Joseph Cornell inspired box. I have knocked this up myself by hand. All, all done, everything, every little bit, except for the frame. The frame was old. Everything else I've sourced together from old junk stores, and I've put it together just for one lucky person to win it. I quite like it myself now. I want to keep it, but I'm not going to. It's going out there. So if you're not aware, check out the last competition post and get your entry underneath there. And if there's an emergency, you can break that glass and that little miniature Dom Benedictine bottle. It's full. Never been opened. So just in case, in you know, 10 years, you might be having a nervous breakdown. You think, okay, I'm going to drink that. I'm going to drink that Dom Benedictine. Smash that glass and grab it. I'm talking crap. Okay, my dear friends. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.